Welcome to The Chase Hudson Show, a podcast dedicated to inspiring you to become extraordinary. Each week, we sit down with top-tier business owners, real estate investors, and influencers to inspire you to build your legacy. It's time to level up. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Chase Hudson Show. Today we have Ricky Barrera, who is a professional DJ. Ricky's got a really cool story. Um, first time having a DJ on the show, um, mixing it up a little bit today, but it's it's interesting to hear his upbringing, uh, single mother, uh, a lot of the, the women influences in his life, um, how he got into DJ and quitting his corporate job to go full-time into that, um, some of the gigs he's done. So interesting story and excited for you guys to hear it. With that, let's jump in. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Chase Hudson Show. Today we have Ricky Barrera, who is a professional DJ. Ricky has DJed all over the country. Uh, He's jammed with Utah power families like the Coveys and the Osmonds. He's also DJed for popular influencers like the Mixers and Freshly Picked. He's brought down the house at weddings, professional sporting events, and much more. So with that, Ricky, welcome to the show, man. That makes me sound way cooler than I am. <laughs> I, no way, dude. I, I, I believe all that's awesome. I mean, it sounds like you've done you've done a lot of cool stuff, and and I'm excited to learn more about your story. Dude, thank you for having me. That was a great introduction. You made me feel like a hundred bucks. I had some good coffee <laughs> before job. coming here, but that put me through the that put me over. I'm, I'm thank you so much. Of course, man. Appreciate that's my it. job. Well, yeah, Ricky. First thing I usually ask my guests is to talk a little bit about your upbringing. So. You know, childhood, teenage, kind of formative years, anything that influenced you or inspired you during those formative years would be awesome. For sure. Like, I'll be I'll be short with this one because there's a lot. You know what I mean? I'm a millennial. I've been around the block. But the, the one thing that about my uh, upbringing is I was raised by a single mom. And that has had in me the biggest impact. I was raised by a Hispanic single mom, you know, in Miami, Florida. I'm from Miami, Florida. Uh, but just being raised by women, like my mom, my sister and other women in my life, I had a very like strong feminine energy growing up. So like I, I, w- I was always doing boy stuff. You know what I mean? Like playing with my friends, playing cards, playing Pokemon cards. You know what I'm saying? Like just having a good old time. Like I had a very, I was very blessed to have like a sandlot type of childhood where we go play baseball and all that stuff during the summer and go swimming and stuff. But when I go home, you know, my sister was watching chick flicks. I'm like listening to the Backstreet Boys. My, you know, my mom was doing her thing. And so the one thing that's had the most impact in my upbringing uh, has been 100%. And I hope this resonates with somebody listening to this. I was just raised by a bunch of girls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but especially a strong mom who was very dedicated to making stuff happen for us in a in a situation where most would fail, she, like many other moms, I'm not saying my mom is the only one that's sacrificed, right? Uh, but she has played a huge impact, if not the biggest impact in my life, for sure, is being raised by a single mom and my sister. Yeah, that's great. And w- w- from a from a work standpoint, was your mom, what what did she do for work? And oh. was that, did it influence you at all? And kind of like, hey, I want to you know, do, do something similar or do my own thing or start like, you know, I guess like how did that, how did that kind of culture or that environment yeah. impact Dude, you from my a mom, work standpoint? My mom was a waitress, bro. Yeah. If you ever go to Miami, for those of you that travel and go down there, oh yeah, I like to go to Miami. There's this restaurant chain called El Rinconcito, which is the corner, whatever. But it's a Cuban Puerto Rican restaurant. Like Mark Anthony's been there, like all sorts of Latino like people. It's, it's very popular. But I was raised uh, watching my mom wait tables my entire childhood. And so watching her work six days a week, 12 hour days for tips. You know what I mean? Yep. And she got it done, bro. Christmas, Thanksgiving, everything. There was always food on the table. We lived in a, and we didn't live like in a mansion, but we lived in a cute apartment growing up. She, she made it happen. And like just watching her provide for us through that time was just, to, uh, oh my gosh, when a, a father, men are always like, oh, they're, they're strong in this, but no, he he dipped, you know what I'm saying? And just so to see, and when you're 12, you know, 11, you're pretty aware. You're not like, oh, what's, you know, what's that? Oh, I'm innocent. You know, like your, your innocence slowly starts to go away 
as you start hitting puberty, you know what I mean? So you're like very aware, like, oh, dad left. <laughs> so now you're very aware that mom is providing everything. And so watching her weigh tables and that, which led me to weighing tables too, when I was like a teenager, like my first job ever was at IHOP. <laughs> when, uh, long story short, but yeah, she weighed tables. She was a hard worker. And so watching her come back tired every day really did something to me. My mom never grounded me. She never said Ricky, because she couldn't, bro. She didn't have time to raise me. I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but through her actions and her sacrifice and her love for us, that raised me. So I was like, I can't F up. I can't mess up. There's no drugs. You know what I'm saying? I can't yeah. be fooling around. Like my mom is working. Let's do this. Yeah. It makes, makes perfect sense. When you see someone working that hard to support you, it's almost <laughs> like there's that extra motivation to, to be good and try to, you know, be not 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 throw any extra pressure her way right so it sounds oh, like that's dude. kind of the dynamic that, that existed it's yeah. great and you fast forward now she's living with us in daybreak you know what i'm saying our yeah. family we have two like my the house circle. my yeah well it's great like my mom lives with me like i shall always have a place in my house and um and, but she'll also stay with my sister sometimes so I, we live up in daybreak and my sister lives a minute 30 seconds from my house so we're neighbors mm -hmm. so full circle now you know we're taking our mom everywhere we're taking her to new york we're taking her trips we just brought her from a resort in orlando you know what i mean like things yeah. like she couldn't do bro so like it's so satisfying to do that now but i guess we'll talk about that later but like to answer your question watching her work as a waitress throughout my teenage and early years has impacted me tremendously for yeah, sure. That's great. Well, yeah, going from kind of teenage years, what, what, what did the next few years look like? I, I couldn't quite nail down if you, if you did college at all, or if that was a thing, something you did, you pursued. I know you ultimately went to kind of work into the, into the workforce, but yeah, yeah. what did the next few years look like after high school? And Oh my gosh, that's such a deep question. I could write a whole book on like those next four years. But long story short, um, I ended up serving a Mormon mission when I used to be LDS. That was a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I respect it. <laughs> <Sure. Yeah. laughs> I respect that. I love you guys. Uh, but part of that, I, I left on a mission. And then when, um, uh, when I left my mission, my family moved out here, including my mom. My sister found her husband. And my mom went through like a second little divorce. I say little because it didn't last very long. Anyways, and so she moved out there. And then while I was on my mission serving for two years, uh, they were here in Utah already. So this is back in like 2010. And so, boom, I landed in Utah. And that's how I got here. Those, so, but, dude, I promise you, there's a lot. I just don't want to waste my – I don't want to, like, waste the time of those – when we could talk about other stuff. But, like, um, that was, for me – there were very important years, like like you know, being LDS and very active in that world. Uh, but that's how I ended up in Utah, you know, from yeah. Miami, Florida. Yep. While I was out there, we were very in tune with like the the elders that would come out. I'll oh, come out to BYU, come to UV or UVSC at the time. Mm -hmm. Come to UVSC. So my sister was like, "Sure, I'll go to I'll go to Zion," you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Orem, Utah, yep. off of University Parkway, and she came out here. She fell in love with the guy and. He, he used to work at the old spaghetti factory, and now he's like the lead engineer architect for Ancestry.com. He's the reason why all of you can do your ancestry. Cool. He is the reason. That's great. <laughs> they just did like the 1956 census or something. Anyways, wow. he's a genius. That's but that's how we ended up in Utah. So I was raised in Miami. My mom was a waitress, single, et cetera, et cetera. We met the Mormons. We got baptized, yada, yada, yada. And then we ended up in Utah after I decided to serve a mission. My sister fell in love, and boom, we ended up here. Got it. God, that was quick. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That makes, I was, yeah, I was gonna ask how you ended up here, but that 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 checks out. And I hope, I, I hope, I don't know how many of you guys are listening right now, but like, I don't know. Hopefully, you can relate to that. Like, I didn't have a very steady upbringing. We were always moving. Things were never really in stone for us growing up. It was always a change. It was always a move. It was always a this. It was always a that. Curveballs left and right. It was not very stable, but it did it. It was great breeding ground for entrepreneurship. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, Utah yeah. is and, and, and having to pivot and adjust your whole life. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's how it is being an entrepreneur. So love it, man. Well, then I read that you worked at Google. Yes. So how did that come about? Brothers and sisters, that's another long story. Long story short. I'm looking at the cameras like, hey, <laughs> long story short. Because all of these, man, all these questions are years, right? They're just sure. years of your life. Long story short, 
I quit DJing because it wasn't for me at the time. It was at a season in my life where I was immature. I didn't know what I, I, I was, it was, I was in the beginning phase of a faith crisis. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like in your early twenties, your brain's not developed. You're like, wait, ah, what do I believe? You know? And I was not in a good place, uh, emotionally, mentally, like I was just not right. So I was like, I hit, I kind of hit a rock bottom a little bit in my early, like 22, I think it was. And I was like, you know what, dude, we'll come back to this. I got to go get my ish together. So let's go get a job. And so I started a job at sales at a company called Clearlink. This is years ago that used to be right off the mouth of the Provo Canyon. We sold satellite internet to the boonies. So I learned how to sail. <laughs> and what that started ended up me being in sales management, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually that company partnered up with Google for us to do their social media marketing for their products. And so we teamed up with Google and Google became my boss. We, I had a Pixel f one, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is years. So this is like years later, like I started, but then like, this is like five years later in my life after doing sales, sales management, sales training, traveling to Arizona to do that, opening stuff. I learned how to sail, which was great. But then like, Ricky, you have a really person, you have that personality. <laughs> And so do you want to work for Google? I was like, heck yeah, I want to work for Google. That's going to look so good on my LinkedIn, you know? Mm -hmm. And I did that for a while and it was awesome. It was really cool to work with people from Google and to have a Pixel phone for free. Yeah, <laughs> I was sure. like, the camera's really good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was social media marketing mainly? or Yeah, social media marketing for them. Yeah, for the product. So it was like for like the uh for the google hey google hey google like you know the little mm -hmm. the little thing you talk to and the phones and yep. the watches and everything like that and it was our job just to make sure that everything was running smooth on twitter and instagram and all that good stuff yeah makes sense so yeah backtracking a little bit you mentioned you kind of quit quit djing to go back into the corporate world how did you initially get into djing so you're coming off your mission did you do it in high school at all was it no. post mission was it how did you even get introduced to that concept good grief man these are questions they're so deep <laughs> um i don't know how many of your guests are like whoa but for me it was a heartbreak bro like this girl lived right next to like liberty square right the heart throb of provo and i was right off my mission and when you're off your mission you're like i'm trying to get married ah you know where's this girl and so long story short i ended up dating this girl who i thought was going to be the one but no i wasn't and obviously <laughs> still, but that heartbreak led me to go to a lot of um, parties in Provo, quote unquote parties in Provo, you know? Yep. But then I started going to more parties like in Salt Lake and, and shows like that. And as I went more and more with friends, I was I started becoming friends with the DJs. And I was like, wait, I could do that. I'm from Miami, Florida. I have a history with hip hop and R&B and all this stuff. I could do it. And that's how that started. I was intrigued by the showmanship of the DJs at these shows. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I went home, I downloaded a software called Virtual DJ, and I just went ham and I started practicing every day. So that's how I got started with DJing here in Utah. Got it. It was a, a little heartbreak. Yep. Yeah. Hey, that, sometimes that's what that's a catalyst that it you know, <laughs> that, that you need to, to jump into something. That it's the best pre workout good. you'll ever take, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Cool. So so then you you do that. How long did you do that before going back to kind of Google in the corporate? Oh, dude, like two years, I think. Two years. I spent two years just trying to figure who I was in the DJ world, you know. Yeah. And uh, it just I, it wasn't my time. Yeah. It got wasn't it. my time, yeah, yeah, dude. So then you're at Google. You're you're doing social media marketing kind of sounds like a pretty stable job. Things are going okay. Yeah. What was it that was like, Hey, I'm ready to jump out of this safety back into DJing. What was kind of the catalyst there? You know, I want to connect this a little bit into men's mental health a little bit. Sure. And because it's so important to like understand the why of why you do things, I believe sometimes. And a lot of men have that. I was just talking to, homeboy at the front Dakota, desk yeah. Dakota and he was like yeah I was doing this but I wasn't happy with it I, I wasn't I forget what the big word was that he used it was something with aviation <laughs> but then he's like well I called Jimmy and I was like Jimmy I have 90 days saved up I want to work for you I want to be happy that's always that's all he was saying he's like Jimmy I want to be happy what the hell do you want me to do here I'll do whatever you want so I can be happy and as I looked back into um as I go back to my childhood 
I was raised on like wrestling. <laughs> I don't know. If, let me explain. This is all going to make sense. I swear to my life, this is all going to make sense. Cause like, why, why that? Right. Um, like what made me want to change from Google to, to, to DJing. And I remember growing up, I was like, I was raised on like the rock and John Cena and Hulk Hogan. And a lot of the things that they had in common was that they talked on the mic and they were like, yeah, brother, or drink your vitamins or the rock saying something. I don't know if you guys are aware, but that's like the old WWE, which was the WWF. And it was a big thing in the nineties and the two thousands. So yeah. it was like the Kardashians, but for teenage boys, sure. you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it was fake, but it was real, but it was fake, but it was real, but it was so entertaining. And I would watch with the popcorn and I was like, ah, oh, I want to do that, but I'm so little, I can't wrestle parallel to that. I was a huge John Mayer fan, and but I was also raised on like Blink One Eighty Two and like Hooba Stank mm -hmm. and like, God, I I could just go on of of, of punk emo alternative rock bands from the early two thousands, and I would just watch them. I was like, ah, oh, I want to be a rock star too. <laughs> I was like, I want to be really good on the mic and entertain the people, but I also want to play music. But I'm not a good singer, and I can only play four chords on my guitar. You know, like four power chords. Mm -hmm. And so that was always in my heart. That was always there. I w and the kid always wanted to do that. But as you get older, you kind of suppress that. And you're like, I I'm trying to make money. So DJing for me was that. DJing for me was the wrestling. It was the, 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 the music in the two. And so that was always in my heart. That was always deep in my soul of what I wanted to do. I just never knew how to do it. So when DJ came around, I was like, wait a second, wait a second. Um, this is it. This is the thing. This is the thing I want to do, but it's not making me money right now. So I'm going to put it on the shelf. And so when I was in, I was uh, at Google and I was making decent money. I was making really good money doing sales management and sales, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't doing the rock. I wasn't being who was staying. I wasn't being blink 182. And so as the monotony hit, I was like, am I really happy, man? Am I really, is this, is this really making me happy? And so I started DJing again on the side and I started to, started to book gigs and I started to play whatever I could just to keep my sanity, you know? Um, and so as, I, as, as the gigs started to match the checks, I was like, hmm, we might have something here, you know? And then at that time, bro, Gary Vaynerchuk was on fire and I, I'm, a, I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk kid baptized into that church but at that point he was like quit your job mother effer you know don't be a don't be a p-word <laughs> you know i don't want to cuss on this one but you know what you know you know the usual sure. and i was like yeah i am a b-word i need to quit my job you know i was inspired and so one thing led to another and i connected that you know i connected so many things in my life i'm like am i really happy at this point i'm in my mid late 20s you know what i'm saying and i was like all right we gotta we gotta start doing something here for us and so connecting the inner child to getting screamed at by Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you connect the two and you're like, you know what, dude, I'm going to jump for me. But I was, I made sure that I had a funnel of gigs. The checks were my checks for DJing were exceeding my checks for work like two times. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So I was like, let's go be happy. Let's take a chance on the kid. Let's, let's take care of Ricky Barrera, little Ricky Barrera. He wants to go. He wants to come play. Let's go. Love it. And here we are, dude. Yeah, man. Five years later. I love it. I love that story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's and, so and long. The, the context. Uh, no, it's, that's perfect, man. That's why we do this. I I, I did want to ask, you mentioned having kind of the, the checks and the pipeline side gig. What was the, like, what, what is your advice to somebody who's in a corporate job or like nine to five has an idea for a side hustle? Like, what is the balance of risk and like having enough on the side versus your corporate, would you advise someone to just quit cold turkey and go full full in? Or do you recommend moonlighting or side gigging? I recommend side gigging until that side gigging starts to pay you more, 100%. Especially today, man, like things are just a little pricier and it's a little risky. And because of social media, more people are doing it, the thing that you're doing. So you have to be really good. You know, exposure is really like big now, like you thought you were the only cool kid and cat that was doing real estate, but you go on TikTok and there's freaking your algorithm is like, here's five ways to make $5 billion right. in one in one house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's like a bunch of gibberish and they don't say anything. But like, I would say, especially today is do your nine to five and then do your five to nine. 
You know yeah. what I mean? Or you're six and nine. Have some dinner, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On wine. And sure. then, you know, so for me, there might be other perspectives out there that, oh, you got to go hard. But I'm like, if especially if you have kids, especially if you have, you know, you have your mortgage, you have your, you know, that stuff is real. That's not a dream. That's, you know, you jump off a building, you're going to fall. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's no net there. Yep. And so I would suggest just sticking with it until your job on the side starts making you that money and you have a funnel. You're like, like he said, he saved up for like 90 days, homeboy, mm -hmm. uh, Dakota. Shout out to Dakota. Yep. He takes care of all the videos. He edits everything. That's right. Um, yeah, I would say that and then jump. Because eventually the inevitable, you have to jump into the pool, baby. Like you yeah. just got to jump eventually, right? Yep. But jump with a little security, would you? Yeah, I think that's the right balance. <laughs> and I, I, I agree. If you, if you can do that, if you can do a side hustle, there's no major conflict or whatever. I absolutely agree and think that that's, that's really smart. Like, so, oh, go ahead. Like, unless you're like a trust fund kid, go ahead, do it. Sure, do whatever yeah. you're paying. You know what I'm saying? Like go at it, have your little adventure. Yeah. But yeah, other than that. Exactly. I, I agree. So diving in a little bit to the DJ. So I've always been curious. I mean, how does one get trained to be a DJ? Like, how do you learn? How do you get it? And then there's like the equipment, the computer, like right. what was the first few years like of you just learning how to to do it. I'm going to go back to the inner child. Yeah. <laughs> it's always men mental health awareness day. All right. Growing up in Miami, Florida, I, on my, on the school bus, like our school bus lady's name is Gina. Shout out Gina. Sure. But Gina, we call it Gina bus, you know, and just like your stereotypical Hispanic, <laughs> just like, you know, POC, like just vibe. You know what I mean? It was awesome. Um, and she would just be playing Tupac and Biggie and freaking Gasolina and like just like that type of music on the way to school, bro. It's like 7 a.m. And we're like, Gasolina, <laughs> you know? And so as a little kid, that was instilled in me. My mom cleaning the house on Saturday mornings, like actually every day, but like just blasting the music. My dad, RIP the homie, um, you know, always blasting merengue and bachata in, in, in the cars, you know? So that's just music. My sister raising me on Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears, MTV, the VMAs, TRL. If you know what the heck that is, you're like, you're like what the heck is that? You know, with Carson Daly, just VH1, like music was just, I was in, it was, I was in a blender of it growing up. And so you asked me like, what, what helped you become a good DJ? What do you do? Well, a lot of us were just raised around a lot of music. So that's just something you can't, you can't teach that one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Unless you become enamored by music later. But like I was, it was like peewee football for me, bro. Like just music. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Like there's some kids that just play baseball all their lives. You're like, how are you so good? Well, bro, I've been throwing the baseball since I was like four. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what music was for me. It was all around me constantly, all the time. And so that was instilled in me as a young, so that's part, that's like the third combination, you know, wrestling, John Mayer, mm -hmm. and a bunch of reggaeton, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like hip hop and R&B. Yep. And oh, dude, when I first became like, in, when I first got introduced to DJing back in like 2010, 2011, like big artists like Skrillex were becoming a thing, Calvin mm -hmm. Harris, Steve Aoki. Um, those were like the big party rock days of like LMFAO and whatever. Every but every song was like a house hit, like with Flo Rida and Kesha and even One Direction and Taylor Swift. They all had like their Rihanna. So it was it was a good time for happy music when I came around. Right. I don't know what it was about the early 2010s, but everything was so happy. All those songs were really That's happy. Yeah. So a lot of these DJs were playing a lot of happy songs and I was like, oh, this is so cool. So I would just take what I would see from because I could hear the music and I could hear the vibes like I could do that I can mix the songs together so I would just go home and I would just like teach myself how to do it I would just practice every day and I would just copy the other DJs so it was easy for me though bro because I it was a thing that I was raised on like music was a thing for me so besides just practicing and copying other artists that's how I kind of figured out DJ yeah. if I always get these DMs from these guys like, oh, bro, so what equipment do you use and all this stuff? And I'm like, oh, you, you're not ready for this. You should already be teaching yourself. Like, if you're asking me questions about how to start, 
Get out of here. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> you, I, like I should. You should have been like. You should like the, the DM should be like Ricky. I've been practicing like for a year now, and I know how to do it. But like, what do you think is the next step for me? And I'm like, ah, okay, great. You've already done the hard part yourself, you know. Yeah. So I didn't get like my first DJ board until like a year and a half after I started DJing. Like the first year of my gigs were on my laptop, just just virtual DJ like iPad type DJing now, right? Yeah. But like on my laptop. Yeah. That's awesome, man. It was great. crazy. That's great context. Yeah, but it's, it's important. The, the important, the most important part of all of that is that the inner kid needed to do that again. Yeah, I can't like emphasize that enough of like how important it is to feed that part of your life because you will have a genuine smile on your face when you're like, "Yeah, we're doing all right." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it, man. It's so when, when, when the last little bit when you were still at Google, how did you? Um, how, what was your approach in terms of getting gigs like you know marketing yourself reaching out like building that pipeline out was that pretty tough to do was it hard <laughs> this I mean, is the most like? this is the most hustle bro part of the whole podcast that we're gonna do but bro, the only thing is that you just have to grind that out ask everybody hustle your balls out dude and just that's how i did it you know yeah. I, I took everything i dm'd people and i had a little bit of a reputation still from like my early days so that helped having some connections but just getting back into the wedding market was like oh my buddy's like i would have a buddy that was getting married and i'm like bro you need a dj and so that's kind of how that started as long as you get to the swing of things and then just shaking a lot of hands networking a lot God, I could write a book on this, yeah, but yeah. just the the usual freaking recipe, bro. Right, you gotta hustle, <laughs> man. You gotta grind. You gotta like sleep. You gotta outwork everybody. Yeah. I saw something like if I fight a bear, we gotta ask him how the bear's doing or some ish like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like that kind of mentality. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the first, I guess, when was that? When did you quit Google? What year? Bro, was that 2018? It's 2018. been five years now. Yeah. 2018. Okay, so five, five six years. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Late man, 18. walk us through the lot. Like that first year after you quit and and kind of that, yeah, ramping up kind of your your resume, your your pipeline. How, how did that go after you quit? After I quit, I knew that it was do or die. And so... I used every gig that I had, and you can relate this to real estate. You can relate this to whatever, right? Like, like even this right here, this podcast isn't. Somebody's gonna hear it, and it could be an opportunity to get a gig. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. It's like, oh yeah, that guy DJ is great, and so I would just every gig that I had was a network opportunity for me. Where after the show, I would shake hands, I would get people's Instagrams, I would connect, and so I just kind of like each gig after the first gig with domino into the next i would draw out my goals of what i wanted to do what shows i wanted to hit how many people i wanted to teach i had like a little i still do um but i would just be like okay i want to make this much so that means i have to get these mini gigs and charge this much and so my that first year afterwards was was like the first entrepreneurship year for me and uh it just it was a lot of learning for me but I had already built gigs all the way to like the summer. And so that's how the each gig went was a networking opportunity for me. So like if you sell a house, you're like, hey, so like are any of your other neighbors looking for houses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuff like that. You know what I mean? Right. So I just learned how to ask and I learned how to shake a lot of hands. Yeah. That's in short, bro. We could spend an hour just <laughs> on like networking and how to network and all that stuff. But yeah. that's in essence what it was for me. It was just a lot of shaking, a lot of handshaking. A lot. You have to be a politician when it comes to this stuff, man. Like mm -hmm. You put on that smile, you put on that suit, you go to work. Yeah, I love it, man. That yeah, makes yeah, sense. yeah. So what is what is a typical day in the life look like for you? Like, how, what's your current schedule? Bro, first and foremost, like, I'm not an ice bath kind of guy or, like, waking up at 6 a.m. As long as I get a good night's rest, oh, my, my rest of the day is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suffer from, like, mild sleep apnea. So just getting... Any kind of rest is a, a win for me. Yeah. And then my days are pretty, I, just, I don't know. I gotta like, this is honest for me. Like the reason why I chose DJing is because Monday through like Thursdays are mine. Yeah. So I get to spend a lot of time with my family, with my mom, with my sister, with my nephew. I'm neighbors with my sister. Um, and so my days are spent with people that I love and at the gym. And then I work, I'll, I'll squeeze in work when I can, but um, it doesn't, it's not the biggest priority for me because the, the bus, like the, 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 the snowball is already, it's, it's going, like it's going, you know what I mean? I'll get up, 
I'll network, I'll post my social media stuff, and then I'll just go live my life. Yeah. That's it. That's great. That's my day, baby. Yeah. Love it, man. <laughs> and then I'll just practice or work on flyers or whatever before I go to bed, mm -hmm. but nothing too intense. Yeah. I like to live my life. Are you like, yeah, is there, is there an aspect of, yeah, practicing? I mean, with your, and I, dude, I have no idea how it works, but it's like, of you know, with, you your, with your board or like at home, <laughs> you're like, are you like, ever, like with the headphones, like getting ready for your sets and like yeah. doing all that stuff mm -hmm. prior? I mean, 100%. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure you're, you're it's just like it. basketball or any other sport, you know, you got to get your reps in. Yeah. And as new songs come in, you got to figure out how to mix those in. Mm -hmm. But I've niched down very hard. And we'll talk about, I think it was one of your questions, like was one of your new projects. Yeah. But I've niched down very hard to the kind of music that I play now. And so it's been, it's like, uh, dude, it's, I don't know how to say this. I hate that it's, I'm going to sound cocky. But like, it's easy for me. Yeah. So <laughs> sure. I could do it with my eyes closed at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I, I, I could look at a crowd and look at you and be like, watch this. This is what they're going to do. And I'll hit play and then, and then they'll do the thing. Yep. Just reading the crowds, all that stuff is second nature at this point. Now I'm in the process of building it to an experience that's amazing. And yeah. Like we'll get to that part. But yeah, I practice. I get my shots in yeah, and it. yeah. That's practice right. we talking about practice <laughs> you gotta practice <laughs> um shout out ai that's right that's right so uh, what's a typical weekend look i mean I, i've seen a couple of your your freaking er, wild your, uh, bro. billboards and your posters coming up mm -hmm. but like yeah is it is it mostly weddings is it like these i know there's events you do for schools universities yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, what's that look like on the weekends You're, dude it just really, like, it really depends summers lots of weddings fall lots of school and traveling and stuff like that and then so it just kind of varies on the season really but as i'm as i'm straying away from weddings because weddings let's be honest here but they pay they pay that's what that's why we do them sure you don't do weddings because oh my god they fulfill my every dj fantasy it's great <laughs> you know when you're watching grandpa and grandma and auntie over there dancing to the macarena you're like yeah, this is what i wanted to do <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. but i've had i've had the privilege now of being considered one of the, the top djs in the state when it comes to this so my gigs are funner with weddings i get dope ass weddings now you know what i mean cool. and so like when i dj bring covey's wedding at the state capitol that wasn't a wedding bro that was an event <laughs> that was insane you know what i mean or when you dj for the osmonds you know you have donny osmond dancing in front of your dj booth you're like holy crap that's donny osmond doing the cha-cha slide right <laughs> yeah. there right what do you mean yeah um, and so it just really depends on the seasons, you know, like this season, I'll be working a lot with the big 12 and BYU sports, which is amazing. I love those people over there as I live in daybreak now in South Jordan. And obviously with my transition years ago from, from being active in that world to not, it's sure. been wonderful to still keep that connection with BYU sports. Yeah. And, and I'm big emphasis on BYU sports because that's a whole nother world <laughs> over there, which is amazing. It's very inclusive. It's very open. It's very progressive. I love it. They're very nice people over there. There's there's great people over there, man. That's great. So I love working with them. And I love what they're doing with with their people over there. So I'm very proud to say that I work with those guys. Yeah, is for this on the BYU sports or university sports side. Is that like a like a pregame thing or is it like a post? -game? How does that? I'm just trying to imagine what an event. Related oh, it's like to for sports. instance, uh, like uh, last year I DJed their uh, Midnight Madness in front Got of it. like six thousand kids at the Marriott. Yeah, you know, it's like cool. the, it's how they kick off their basketball. And then I went inside the stadium for football and I DJed in front of those student section to get them hyped for the homecoming game love it and bro it's insane yeah, <laughs> to do sure. it's like sports you yeah, know awesome. and it's cool because like there's i'm literally the only dj in the school history that's been on the field at lavelle to play these songs and they're like i'm like what am i not supposed to what are the songs that they're like play whatever you want i'm like whatever i want are you, are you sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we have at it. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play. But you know what? I'm gonna keep it clean. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so to say that is a is a privilege. It's it's yeah. awesome because I grew up on BYU stuff. You know sure. what I mean? Like going to education week every week at the man, you know, over there, like mm -hmm. doing my thing when I, when I was very active in that. Mm -hmm. So BYU always played a big role in my life. So now to be apart from it, you know what I'm saying, and, and doing my thing, but to still have like your DNA there. Sure. 
Yeah. It's amazing. I'll always want a cougar tail. I'll always want to sit in the bleachers yeah. and root for the cougars for sure. That's great, man. That's mm-hmm. great. So what, yeah, what is the next, I mean, you mentioned some of these bigger names, Skrillex, some of these guys who are, I mean, what's, what is the next little bit for you? What's your goal with the whole, with, with DJing? So I'll go back to man's mental health. Yeah. <laughs> it's so important that you do what you love to do. And I feel like a lot of us sometimes get caught up on what everybody else is doing and then perfecting that thing instead of literally just doing you. And I'll go back to my sister. My sister raised me on NSYNC and Britney and Backstreet Boys and all these very poppy, happy music type people, Beyonce, whatever, Justin Timberlake, all that. And so just recently I had a paradigm shift where Right now, those people are like Harry Styles and Taylor Swift, you know, uh, the 1975, you know, these happier, poppier, uh, the lead singer of the 1975 can get a little rough, but I resonate with him, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, I've transitioned heavy from being a top 40 hip hop R&B DJ to doing my, what I call my Haler nights, mm-hmm. which is a combination of Harry Styles, Taylor Swift, and all sorts of other pop music that we play, but this caters much to a more feminine energy concert than it does like a heavy hip hop. And I love, dude, I could talk hip hop all day, all sure. day with you. I love hip hop. I'm a student of the game, but my, my, my shows now reflect more of if I had a little girl, could I bring her to the show? Would she have a good time? And the answer is yes. Cause I had a mom bring her little girl to my show last month and she's like, we're having a blast. And I was like, all right. (laughs) So yeah, that's where I'm at right now with DJing. I'm doing it for me, not for the, for the money. If that makes sense. The money's still coming, which is great. But now I've transitioned to a more happier, friendlier, more feminine energy show. That's more safe for the girlies. And it's, it's, it's a better environment for everybody. It's an all ages event. We have a 21 plus bar. You can come. It's for everybody. It's like a concert. It's literally a concert. So I've shifted from a club type set to more of a concert show. Got it. Which is where I'm, which is where I thrive. Yeah. When did that, when did you do that transition or kind of stuff? How much time do we have? (laughs) (laughs) But connecting it back to the inner child with my sister, I'm like, this resonates more. And I'll answer that question. Just to kind of wrap up that other question. I forgot to connect it. I'm so sorry. But I resonated again. That's what the kids love to do. That's what the kid like. That's what my sister and I dance to. Mm-hmm. And we're excited now for an NSYNC reunion. It's the rumor. It's the rumor, you know? But we've seen Backstreet Boys together and all that stuff. So again, if you're lost, if you're looking for, like, what should I do with my life? Just go back, man. Just go back to when you were a kid. What did you love to do then? And so now we fast forward a couple, few decades later, later. And here I am doing the exact same thing that that kid loved to do. He loved the wrestling. He loved the John Mayer. He loved the pop music. And I've incorporated all of that into this show. But can you repeat that question again? The one that yeah, you just, just asked just me? When did that transition go from kind of, you know, money, more money focused to kind of doing more passion? And- TikTok, bro. TikTok. I, I TikTok. TikTok's been changing my life. Because <laughs> yeah. now everybody's like, everybody's connected to the... To the to the to the mainframe, dude. Everybody's like sharing ideas, and so one day I was just going through TikTok, and I noticed these girls in Australia, dude. And it was like a Taylor Swift night at this concert hall, and they were all screaming and crying and having a great time. And I'm like, what is this? There's no guys there, nobody like creeping on them. They were all just being themselves, and they were just being happy. And I'm like, is this a thing, bro? So I went down the rabbit hole. This is like almost two years ago. I went down the rabbit hole, and I'm like, a Taylor Swift night, Taylor Swift night. One Direction night, One Direction night, Harry Styles night, Harry Styles night, and I was like, 1975. Are you gonna? I'm like, what is this? Why? Why the, the artist isn't even there? Like, <laughs> but they're they're like, they're they're like energized by it, you know, because the songs mean so much to them. And so I was like, I need to try that. And so long story short, I tried it, and I became hooked. And I was like, this is the energy that I want in my life. This is what I want. I'm tired of being big macho DJ put your hands in the mother effing air sure. kind of vibe to, and I've always been gentle, bro. Like I've always been a nicer DJ, you know what I mean? But that environment breeds that kind of DJing. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is more calm. It's energetic still, but it's not about, it's not about like the club. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is more about the audience. And so I became hooked. That's, that's part one of the big switch for sure. 
Love it, man. And I think that that I've seen your poster that you mentioned the Haler night that's coming up in October. October twenty right? first, baby. Okay. Let your girls come. It's yeah. gonna be fun. Yeah, sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, love it, dude. And I owe a lot of that to to people like Jess from Mixers and the owner of Dirty Licious. You know, like these women that create these businesses, and you know, like. In 1984, a girl needed, like, permission to get a debit card from her husband. You know what I'm saying? So to see girls my age thriving and, oh, it's so inspiring to see Jess and these girls, like, from Pick Me Up. The, oh, did I say that right? Uh, pick, pick uh, I'm, oh. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm saying the, the name wrong. The girl that made the shoes. Oh, 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 freshly picked. Freshly yeah, picked. Jeez, right. I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> But they inspired a lot of it, too, because I'm like, I want to create something like this. Like, it's this feminine energy that men forget that they have in them, you know? Yep. You were born from a mom, bro. Like, it's in you. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, stop stop resisting the earth. Let's go get our nails done, bro, you know? <laughs> and so that played a huge part in it, too, because people like Jess and, like, them, I'm like, I want to create something where they would want to come to as well. You know what I mean, right. and so a lot of a lot of played into it, but it's been definitely influenced by like my sister and these amazing women. Just get it done. Yeah, love it, dude. Mm-hmm. I have been curious. So on the on the equipment side, like you see these DJs with the speakers and the thing and the pole thing. I mean, is that all your stuff? No, nah, bro. You have that? For no, I have or? a little setup for my weddings, but everything else I rent. I could care less about equipment. Hey guys, guess what? I could care less about equipment. Okay. <laughs> I just hook up to whatever's there and then I have my cute little setup. Yep. But I I don't really I'm not a technical nerd. Yeah. I hate it. using the word nerd, it's so derogatory. I'm not techie, bro. You got it. I don't know how many watts anything has. I don't even know what a watt is. Yeah. I got it. No, I, I'm just really curious because you see all this stuff. I'm like, dude, if those guys have to lug all that around, but if you rent it, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, especially but. when I'm like out of state and stuff, like yeah. I ha- that they have to provide a company and I'll just come and play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That. Well, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned kind of money focusing on that. I mean, how, yeah. So as an entrepreneur, you know, how do you, what role does kind of money play in your life? It sounds like it's not really as much of a focus right now for you, but like, how have you thought about that dynamic from childhood to now in terms of like money and that being a pursuit or not a pursuit or focus for you? I heard this quote that was like, money is a sixth sense. It allows you to enjoy all of the other five. Mm. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you make enough of it to meet your needs, and then the rest is just for fun, I guess. But I've never really focused uh, money being the uh, the final outcome for me because I've made a lot of money in sales, and I was miserable, bro. Yeah. I was not happy. I was like, I need to go do something else. You're like on your LinkedIn looking for other opportunities. You're like, well, can, where's happiness for me, you know? And so, but because I'm good at it, <laughs> Uh, the money comes. Yeah. And so I'm very blessed. I'm very fortunate to have a, a thriving business that way. Um, but money, um, God, dude, oh, I hate that word. But like, I, it's just not it for me. Yeah. But it's there, and I'm very happy that I make it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's always good to get people's insight in here, and I think that's that's a great, yeah, great yeah. way to think about if it. If money is your drive, bro, then you know it's not the right reason. It's not. It will never. Money will never bring you that joy. Oh. It will provide experiences, though. If you if you're doing it right, I have nothing against that. Sure. You know, being yeah. on a boat and jet ski is fun. Right. Yeah. I love right. jet skis. Take me yeah. out. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Well, uh, Ricky, what's one piece of advice that you would maybe give to somebody looking to make a jump to entrepreneurship, uh, starting their own business? Well, how would how would you like to relate that to anybody? Else? There's so many tips, man, and I would. Oh God, again, another book on that subject. But like, it's like Tony Stark said in Endgame when he was talking to his dad. He's like. No amount of money ever bought me any more time. And so, or, or how the Lord said in the scriptures, right? Wherever your heart is, your tre- wherever your heart is, you know, your treasure will always be, or something like that. Sure, yeah. Did I say that right, guys? Where your heart is, there will also be your treasure. You know what I mean, right? Yep. And so, do it for the right reasons. Do it, do it because you love it, and then the money will come. But if money is your focus, you'll never be happy. And if you sacrifice family time for that, for you old heads, you know, like that's one of the biggest regrets. Like you see those TikToks where it's like they interview these old people, you know, none that one says, I wish I would have made more money. They're all like, damn, I wish I would have spent more time with my wife. I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have been there for my friends. 
that's all that matters at the end of the day. So as you focus on, and I'm, you have a family, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You you can attest to this, right? Like nothing makes you happy than seeing your wife and your kids happy and spending time. It can be a pain in the ass to like raise them and stuff. You know, everybody has their troubles, but like ultimately you're happy, man. Yeah. And that's what makes you happy at the end of the day. And that's why you go to work. That's why you have this podcast. As we do all of this, it's just to provide for them. But at what cost, you know, of time? That's the one thing none of us will get back ever. Right. I know people believe their things or whatever. As far as I know, this is it. <laughs> and so as you aspire, and the reason why I chose DJing was because I'm like, that job, well, if I ever have a kid, will allow me to race that little sucker. Mm-hmm. I'll be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe Sunday, but I'll be there. And that's all I want is just to be present. Yeah. If it's exactly. taking you away, bro, reprioritize your, your shit. Sorry. And figure it out so you spend more time with your loved ones. And I know that's a privilege, but like a lot of guys that come in here talk about real hard work and all that stuff. And I will echo that, but do it for the purpose of spending more time with your family and the mm-hmm. people that you love. Yeah. Good stuff, man. There's way more, many more tips that I can give you, but that one is a core <laughs> yeah. principle for me. Yeah. It's great. Well, um, kind of last, last, last question here, Ricky, for Damn, you. Damn, we're at the end. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, we're, we're flying through it, man. Oof. Um, what in terms of success? So this is something I usually ask most of my guests. So when you think about your life, and we kind of touch on a few of these things, but how do you define like a life well lived? You know, at the end of the day, how do you define success, kind of day in and day out in your life, Ricky? That's a great question. For me, success recently has been my mental health. And I cannot emphasize this enough. And I don't know how many people are going to listen to this, but if there's the one, (laughs) there's the one is that over the last few years, I have had a beautiful time getting to know myself and figure out who I am and what I believe. And success for me has been having the ability to love myself and to take care of myself first. That is priceless, bro. Um, being able to see a therapist and being able to see a mental health doctor and being able to really break down those walls in your life of any trauma and any, because a lot of time of us, a lot of us just work hard to get, because we're hurt, bro. You know what I mean? Like we want to show like our dad that left, like, Hey man, like I I can do this without you or a divorce. Hey, I, I can do this without you or a heartbreak of sort, you know, or a loss, right? And we do it, we work, We instead of talking about it, we just work about it. <laughs> yeah. And we suppress a lot of that work, a lot of that emotion through work and through success and through getting shit tons of money. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of guys that are very rich were very hurt at one point in time. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. But But they don't take the time to really take care of themselves. And so for me, success in the last, I would say since before the pandemic. So the last four years, last three years has been a journey of taking care of the inner child, making sure he's okay. And then just making sure that I'm good and mentally right to be with my family. Everything else is second to me. Everything else is second and third to me. My job, my career, everything is just, it's secondary at this point for me. And, um, that's success. That's how I would define success for me is being able to be mentally right with myself. Cause that, that will come about you in the butt later, bro. Yeah. Love it, man. Well, honestly, I, <laughs> no better way to end. And I, I agree with that completely. I, I think, uh, this has been, this has been eye opening, man. Really, uh, really a cool. I honestly, I've never had a DJ on the show. No. <laughs> this has been, I am a human being, bro. Yeah. Can I add one more thing yeah, though? Cause please. I know you're wrapping it up. Yeah, of like, course. Besides like the mental health part of it, for me, the success part has been these Haler nights for me. Yeah. Um, if the girlies that go to my shows and the people that are listening to this, I cannot tell you, bro, how life-changing these shows have been for me. Like, they have flipped my life in 180. I'm a better man because of them, and I'm a better human being because of it, and I am a much better DJ because of them. And it's all because there's this feminine energy involved. And I could do a whole freaking other hour about this, but... 
if there's any of the boys listening, man, I'll end with this. <laughs> Imagine you're with your little girl, or if you have a little girl in your life, if that's like a, a niece or just your friend's little girl. Oftentimes, sometimes that little girl will want you to come have tea with her or play dolls with her, you know? And a lot of us will look at that and we're like, oh, that's not, oh, that's cute. You know, that's not for me. But all that little girl is trying to tell you is to calm the F down. Settle down, daddy. Have tea with me. Settle down, daddy. Play dolls with me. Like, I think she's doing it unconsciously. But she's looking at you stressed. She's looking at you worried. She's looking at you like, bro, stop punching the wall. Come have some tea time with us. Or when the girlies go ask you to get your nails done. Or when the girlies go and say, let's go shopping, you know? For me, as I've, as I've, uh, as I've grown, I'm like, they're telling me to chill and to enjoy myself because they figured it out. The girlies and the gays, they got it. <laughs> Where we're like, nah, ice cold bath, let's go. Arr. You know, we like, we punish ourselves to get success. And I'm like, wait, there's something wrong here, bro. And so by doing these shows, I've, I've accessed this power, bro, that's there. It's this feminine, powerful energy that has driven these shows. And I can't, these girls line up like an hour before the show and it's wrapped around the corner mm. and they're dressed up and they have their friendship bracelets that they made at home and they make these shirts f just for the shows and they're dressed up and they're ready to give you this love, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, what is this world, bro? You know what I mean? And so, but I, and so if I could finish with one thing, it's just to, to calm down, relax, take your chill pill and, See how you can connect yourself to that energy because it's blessed my life tremendously. We all come from a woman. <laughs> that energy is there for us to use. And it's a superpower, man. Like I, I started this podcast talking about my mom and her. That's feminine energy that drives me. And through the middle of this podcast, I talked about my sister and the Backstreet Boys. That's feminine energy. And I'm wrapping it up with some feminine energy for you. Because yeah. a lot of us m males need to learn from our wives and our little girls and our sisters and our moms and our grandmas. Yeah, There's power there. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I love it, man. You, you mentioned some of these figures in your life. I've had many women you know, in my life that have impacted me significantly, my wife being a huge one. Uh, we have three boys. I have a daughter. <laughs> I will be I'll be first to sign up for some some tea parties. Girl with, dad. With, uh, yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So shout out Kobe. Fingers crossed. There you go. <laughs> well, Ricky, thanks a lot, man. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you Dude, sharing your story pleasure. with us and getting to know you a little bit better. And for anyone listening who's in need of a DJ, this is your guy. <laughs> Ching baby. This yeah. is your guy right here. <laughs> Plug so, me in. Um, no, seriously, man. If if yeah, I'm, we're gonna have events in the future. So anyway, I'm glad we could connect and get to know each other. I'll so. come back for episode two. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, dude. Thanks for listening to The Chase Hudson Show. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Reviews really help us to find better guests and to improve the overall quality of the show. If you'd like to connect with me directly or want to learn more about investing in real estate, send me a DM on Instagram at official Chase Hudson. Again, we really appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you in the next episode.